carried with it that design from the past as it moved into these evolving eras of, of warfare. Derek, Derek and I are no way. noticing this bowing in the in the side of the hull. It matches up with the side scan that we're yeah. seeing. Right yeah, this yeah, I was location. seeing that in the uh, what you guys are talking about in the sonar, Great the scanning sonar. Yeah, so I'm curious about that sort of deformation of the ship in this area. I mean, do you think that was from battle damage or from uh, impact-related stress on the just propagating? Well, the yeah, the um, the bomb was not at this part. The bomb was um, that hit it was uh, kind of midships, so it wasn't here, and it was torpedoed on the uh, starboard side. So I would expect that this might have been torsion when it uh, when it struck the seabed. Mm -hmm. Yep, is a guess. Of course, the uh, the near miss that disabled the rudders uh, yeah, landed. Yeah, that's true. On, oh, that's a good point, Russ. Yeah, that could have been this. Um, yeah, because there's an, and it also shut off some of the water uh, flow that would have helped fight fires. One of those uh, water spigots was uh, stuck closed. Yeah. Nautilus, we're also approaching an area where there was that near miss and the question of damage in this area is another one that we were wanting. Yeah, we're Russ, wanting Russ, Russ was just postulating that this um, buckle in the hull was might have been from that. Uh, Shoreside, just a FYI, we're, um, we're doing a shift change right now, so if you just bear with us a couple of minutes, uh, we'll have a new watch team um, uh, standing by. And I much appreciate it. Thank you.
8 to 12 watch is coming on right now. So give us a few minutes and we'll be settled. Check, check. Beautiful 8 to 12 watch family and all the viewers. That was watch lead, Valf and Leeson. This is Daniel Kinzer, science communication fellow. We are very excited to be coming into the control van. This is our first watch on this uh, historic historic dive on the IJN Akagi. So, yep, as Val pointed out, we're right in the middle of watch change. People are just getting comfortable in their seats and uh, we'll be back online with you in just a minute. You're welcome to send us some updates, send us some comments and questions on Nautilus Live. Mahalo. I uh, don't think we are. Um, I'm just going to get them to start moving soon. I'm just getting a quick bearing. What the heck here? Hmm. What's up? So they've been coming in to what appears to be like a kind of big hole in the side of the ship. So they finally got closer and so now we're going to keep moving towards the stern. Yeah, it appears so. I'll wait for Mike to get back. Yeah, so I think we're going to come back this way. Nautilus, this is uh, Silver Spring. Go ahead, Silver Spring. We are currently sitting just off of the port side, close to the stern of Akagi. What, just as you were coming on watch, we encountered at one level, sitting basically on a shelf on the hull, what we call Cape's Mate Gun, which go back to when the vessel was originally built as a cruiser mm -hmm. to fight another ship as opposed to air, aircraft defense. We're at an area where the flight deck used to come out over the hangar deck and proceed aft, leaving very little of the stern exposed. That all appears to be gone now, as well as the anti-aircraft guns that were up there protecting it, as well as a fair amount of the, the hangar decks. We're in an area, in other words, with a great deal of uh, destruction. Okay. One of the key points that we're gonna be looking for uh, as we move on now with you when Mike gets back, is that we're going to want to start moving aft to get to the tip of the stern. With that, what we want to be looking at is there was a very close hit that missed the carrier, about which uh, this port quarter uh, may have damaged the hull. So we'll be looking for any distortion, meaning of that sort in that area. But at the back end of the, 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 of the carrier, at its stern and on the counter of the stern, we may see the name of the vessel, uh, Akagi, in, rendered in Japanese kanji characters. And that's something that we'll also be, be looking for. So just to give you a, a little bit of a forecast as to where we're gonna go and what we'd like to see, that's, that's where we're at now. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Good to be working with you again. Mahalo, Silver Spring. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be in the control van with you again, uh, with the Exploration Command Center team uh, and all the partners involved in this expedition. Mike's, Mike's back in the room and I think we'll, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll be ready to, uh, to make that move. We're, we're all excited to see if we'll be able to see those, those kanji and, and see some more of this uh, incredible mo'olilo, this incredible story of, 
of this Japanese vessel. So thank you guys for being here and sharing that with us. And uh, Mike, you want to you want to take it away? Yeah. Um, let me, so are we did we get to the stern? No, not yet. Not yet. OK. That, all right. Cool. Um, oh, I see it in the sun right now. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're moving there. So um, are we on a ship move right now? No, we we're going to wait for you to get back just Sounds to double check. Good. Yep. Yeah. So um, let's. Um, so just a quick overview for you guys. It's been it's been a little tough to stay like at the deck edge because there's been a lot of debris and, and pokey things. Um, we've, we've, you know, we keep kind of moving. The, the wreck's oriented around 45 degrees, but it's um, it's kind of, there's some, some weird parts, some like buckled in, some falling out. So it's been kind of like moving back and forth. It's a little bit uh, harder to stay at that sweet spot where we can illuminate and, and the, the, the deck with our lights at the, in the right way. So it's been a little bit harder to, net, to maneuver that this time around. Um, but so far, so good. Uh, yeah, as Jim said, we, we do want to get to the stern. Um, I think we're probably um, where the, the near where the flight deck ended, uh, or the hangar deck ended, and there are supports for the flight deck. Um, but yeah, if we could just um, lateral a little bit to the right and uh, maybe get a little closer if possible. Yep. Um, so maybe like a 35 degree move, cool. maybe 10 meters to start. All right, yep, perfect. Bridge now. Like our system, given where we're looking at the gun, we're also some upright structures there. Yep. Yep. Uh, so we we are right at the end of the hangar deck and trending tending back towards there. Mike, did you hear what we were also talking about? Wanting to see if there was any buckling or any other structural uh, evidence of that near miss that took place right off with that hit the just missed the fourth quarter? Yeah, uh, Russ is, was talking about that uh, right before I stepped out of the room. We did see that. Um, it was buckled in uh, a few minutes ago. We, we were looking at that. Were you watching then? We were watching then. What we weren't sure of was whether or not that buck, if that was actual buckling or if we were just looking at some other aspect of the hull. It, it was hard to see. It looked buckled, but you guys may have made the call that it was definitely buckling. We weren't sure. Well, n not for sure, but it, you could see it in uh, in the scanning sonar that we have, and you could also see it in the AUV image from 2019. There's a there's a section that looks uh, like there's a, a, a like a faint semicircle uh, dent in the hull, um, and so that I've seen it kind of three different ways now. So whether it was from that or not. That's a good point by Russ that it may have been caused by that. I can't think of, you know, the, the, the torpedoes were on the other side and the, the aerial bomb was not in this area. So that's the only thing that, that I think makes sense for that. Right. No, I under, understood. And we were also looking at the AUV sonar uh, at that and saw that same anomaly. My point is, uh, as we begin to do that move, it would be nice to take a closer look. That's that's all. I. Another look and another set of eyes, once again, assessing it is always good. Yeah, I, I think at the moment we've passed that, actually. Note it as a possibility and, uh, and keep on moving. Okay. Just into the van and already deep into the collaboration across uh, many time zones, across many partners. Um, it's one of the most exciting um, and interesting and, and uh, I think important parts of this exploration is our ability to work together. Um, thanks to this magic of telepresence and it's not really magic, but uh, <laughs> the power associated with it, it's really, uh, it's, it's really amazing that we're able to uh, bring this to you, all of our viewers, and also connect with experts and um, marine archaeologists across many different institutions, across international borders. Um, and if we, have, if we have some time, it'd be great for the 8 to 12 watch um, to uh, introdu introduce themselves to our audience. I'm sure we have many people around the world just now tuning in. So I can go first. My name is Daniel Kinzer. I am a science communication fellow um, on board Nautilus. This is my second expedition uh, with Nautilus, and I'm so thankful and so lucky to be back. 
and be in the sacred waters of Papahanaumokuakea, participating in these historic archeological dives, remembering and honoring um, the incredible bravery and service of uh, soldiers and sailors on, on both sides of this battle, and just learning with and from uh, just a remarkable set of, of scientists and now friends and crewmates on board this ship. And uh, really, really thankful to be here. I, I call Honolulu, Hawaii home. Uh, and, and yeah, this is just a really special opportunity. And I'll, uh, I'll pass it to my left, over to Mahina. Mm. Hi, aloha ahi ahi kako, o mihinalani kavaleri ko uinoa. Good evening, everyone. Mahalo for tuning in and joining us for this historic uh, dive. What a privilege and honor. I am from the island of Oahu. It is my first time sailing aboard Nautilus. Um, and I feel very grateful to be in Papahanaumokuakea, a very spiritually and culturally significant place to Kanako Iwi, to the native Hawaiian people. Um, as Dan had mentioned on one of our earlier dives, this is just a privilege of a lifetime. And especially knowing all the sacrifice um, and bravery that took place here at these dives. So thank you so much. Mahalo nui. Let's throw it down the line to Kukui. Mahalo um, nui. Aloha mai koko, everybody. Oba o Kukui. My name is Kukui. I come from the island of Maui, and I am one of the data loggers on board. And I am super honored and grateful to be able to, hear, to be here with all of you folks on board and on shore, um, getting to be in this very special and sacred place in Papahano Mokuakea, and getting to be able to learn about the stories of everyone who served and sacrificed over here. So mahalo. Virginia? Hi all, uh, I'm Virginia. I'm a PhD student at Florida State University and I am here as a researcher. I'm an ecologist and a coral biologist, uh, particularly studying seamounts, but I'm ecstatic and really honored to be a part of this um, collaborative effort looking at these, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Mike Brennan. I'm a maritime archaeologist with Search Inc. Uh, I'm a co-lead scientist for this expedition. Um, and uh, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. All right. Uh, I'm Val Finlayson. I'm uh, the other co-lead scientist on this uh, expedition. I'm a high temperature isotope geochemist, uh, currently postdocing at the University of Maryland. And uh, I specialize in uh, uh, geochemistry of seamounts, uh, uh, like some of the ones we were diving on uh, right at the beginning of this expedition. And for the moment, uh, just uh, running support for uh, the watch while we're uh, uh, doing these uh, document uh, documentation dives on uh, these uh, World War II carriers. That's a, that's a world-class back row, um, perhaps only superseded by the world-class front row on the <laughs> watch. Um, oh, easily. Those are fighting words. We'll, 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 send <laughs> we'll send it over to you, Kata. Hello, good evening, or good morning to wherever you're watching from. My name is Catalina Rubiano. I'm a master's student at USF's College of Marine Science in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm here serving as a navigator. And yeah, it's been a privilege to dive these really incredible wreck sites with this awesome group of people. Robert Waters. I'm uh, sitting in a Herc pilot seat with no Herc. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm OET's uh, facilities manager and ROV engineer back in San Pedro, California. Uh, I'm Zach. I'm Robert's co-pilot. Um, come from Houston, Texas. I've uh, been doing ROV for a couple years and a uh, uh, pleasure to be here with the team. And uh, our amazing video engineer is uh, doing amazing video engineer tasks, uh, trying to make sure we, we keep our image on on the Akagi. If, you're, uh, if you've if you been with us over uh, for, for a while, you know that we typically dive um, with, with ROV Hercules and dive a two ROV system. But if you saw our dive on Yorktown, our historic dive a 
couple of days ago on Yorktown, USS Yorktown, um, or have been with us earlier on this dive. Yeah, that's what I was... You know, we're diving with Atalanta um, at extreme depths, yeah, over 5,300 meters deep uh, in the far northwestern reaches of Papahanaumokuakea, sacred waters, Kapuna Islands uh, of the Hawaiian people where... We're almost 20 meters off the bottom. This historic battle, the Battle of Midway, um, took place over 80 years ago and and uh, yeah, this that Japanese looks like and it's sticking out, whatever that is. Japanese and American conflict ended with so many ships um, and many lives settling uh, in these sacred waters, in or these depths. The heading a little bit. And it's, uh, it's just a tremendous honor to bear witness to this and took an incredible amount of skill from our engineering and mapping teams, our navigation teams, our scientific yeah, teams and archaeologists. There. I don't know so, how far it goes, but Excited for what we can continue to learn and the story that unfolds. We're just looking at the edge of something. Yeah, it looks like it continues on out here. So we're like maybe, because it looked like we were kind of into the wreck there, right? Yeah. But I don't see it on the sonar at all. Because we're 18 meters up, we got a little room here. You're uh, listening in. If, if you're 18 meters up, you might be um, too high to capture the stern. Well, you can see it. You can see structure off here to the port. Yeah, but the um, the hangar deck stops, and then the the bow section is actually a uh, lot shorter in or lower in profile than the rest of the carrier. Okay, we just have this stuff jutting out right here. Yeah, that might be the, the deck edge, actually. So if you come down a little bit, we might see it in sonar. You're listening to our ROV pilots, Robert Waters and archaeologist uh, Mike are, are uh, just making sure we can safely navigate around this corner across the stern of the ship. There's some lines hanging down there, too. Yeah. 12 right now. Yeah, that looks like the deck of the bow. Oh, the bow? Oh. I'm sorry, stern. the stern. stern. Yeah. stern. Yeah, the other bow. We, we were just on the bow. <laughs> Mike's, Mike's been up yeah, for a long whatever. time. So, uh, yeah. And yeah, the that's world the world might be upside down sometimes. For that's why he's got a great support team right now. <laughs> Silver, Spring, Silver Spring calling Nautilus. Yeah, Roger, we hear you, we hear you, Silver Spring. Would you like to introduce yourselves and, and offer a little more context and direction here? Well, actually, what we want to do right now is take a quick look at this area because we're in an area where there was a close detonation of an aerial bomb that did not strike, could have damaged the carrier. So uh, where you're at right now is, is good. We just allow us to just take a look at this for a bit. Uh, we may ask you to shift a little bit maybe go down a little bit, and once yeah. we're through that, then we'll introduce we're, ourselves. We're kind of kicking up dust right here, so I think if we go down much more. Silver Spring, not sure if you heard uh, our ROV pilot, Robert, but uh, just making sure we don't uh, kick up too much sediment, and, uh, uh, but absolutely, Understood. Roger, we, we, uh, we hear that, we hear that request. Well, thank you very much. And, and feel free to- One of the key things, Please. Go ahead. No, you continue, please. One of the key things that we're looking for with all of this is, of course, since nobody has seen this carrier for 81 years, uh, yeah, and we do know from the accounts at the time and the after-action reports of hits as well as near misses, uh, this is an opportunity for us to assess actual battle damage. Uh, and so that's 
pretty critical aspect of, of, of the mission. So we really do appreciate what you're doing. We are seeing the dust kick up. We don't want to get it too cloudy. We defer to your uh, to your your judgment on this, particularly if we're going to get to a stage where we get it stirred up. Yeah, we're we're 13 meters up, but you know we're we're sort of heaving a lot, and it's sort of pumping uh, water down onto the bottom and kicking up the sediment. Uh, yeah, no, understood, Robert. Thank you for. Thank you for doing this. Would a zoom at this angle help at all? I don't know if it would cut yeah, through. Maybe. I mean, it looks like it's pretty vertical right there. Yeah. That section. Oh. It's kind of dark, like down in the towards the bottom of what we can see. I don't know if it's a hole I mean, in the side. Could, we could try coming down a little more, but I think we're going to start pumping yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a lot of dirt. Yeah. All right. Let's go down a little bit more. You're a little closer in than we were before. We were lower than this on the previous dive, but it may be that... Uh, it looks like we're heaving up and down like five meters or something. Yeah. So. What we were seeing in the sonar, and I'm interested in your take on it as well, is there was, of course, a, a, a bend or it looked to be a buckle in the hull on uh, the AUV footage from the 2019 uh, so AUV we're sonar. Right, this is into the into the sediment right here. Yeah. You can see it. It's built up. Come down. Got it. Yeah. Is the uh, is the ship still moving? Uh, no, we we're settled here now, and I, I guess it's your call what you guys want to do next. You said you wanted to, well, they said they wanted to take a look around. I don't oh, really yeah. know how much more we'll we'll be able to do. Yeah. Um, maybe we we can move a little bit I and mean, see if it an, looks an, like, an angle. You know, we're on sort of a slope here, and you know we're getting close to the bottom. Yeah, Bob, can you pan left a little bit? Jim, I think that might be your buckle there. Do you see that curve in the hull? Jim and Silver Spring, thank you guys for uh, that context and helping us understand what we're looking for and how we're piecing together this story. I Mike was just double checking and it seems like we're looking at a curve, some curvature in the hall that, that could possibly be a buckle from, from some of those, that battle damage is, do you have a comment on that? That's a big heave. Mm -hmm. Jim, are you there? There's definitely a curve in this hull right here. Yeah. Yeah, there's a space right below it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're in the area where that, that near miss happened, and so it's entirely possible that what we are seeing is battle damage. And while this certainly did not contribute to sinking the vessel, it, um, this... I would not have wanted to have been in that case, mate, or anywhere near this. Yeah, that must have been quite an impact from from that uh, so what's near miss. What's this round structure down here? That's a casemate gun. It's a it's a um, it's a gun from when it was being built as a cruiser, but it's meant uh -huh. to be like a ship to ship fire, not anti aircraft. Uh -huh. All right. Um, so we're we need to move. Um, Catalina, I think mm -hmm. we can start to lateral towards the stern. Yep. Nope. I was just, I was just lateral in the other direction just to get to get that shot. It, yeah, so yeah. Can, yeah, no, I know. I, I can yeah. come back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, I appreciate that. I'd, I'd asked for that. That's, that's good. Um, we just wanted to double check that. But um, yeah, back from where you were, we want to continue to lateral to the right. Yep. Perfect. We can do that. 
So, so not Nautilus. Nautilus. We're here. Nautilus. Go ahead. The sense here is that we are, you know, this would be the area of that hit by a thousand pound bomb. That detonation, the expansion bubble is from the detonation. Not only would have done this, but this hit disabled the rudder. And so that became a real a very critical problem for the care. Thank you, Silver Spring. Thank you for that. If you if you can, Silver Spring, there's a still a bit of feedback. I know it's it's hard to eliminate, but uh, if possible, um, if there's a fix to some of the feedback on your end, it'd be great. Yeah, we're picking up a small echo. Yeah, maybe um, mute any mics that are not uh, being used. But don't mute me. I'm being used. <laughs> <laughs> Would have happened a long time ago if we were going to do that, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> long time ago. It's clearly a joke. It's such a such a pleasure to uh, to watch Mike and our archaeology team just um, one do such a skillful, like just a masterful job of of uh, proceeding with this exploration, but also just how much they enjoy these investigations. It's uh, it's a tremendous privilege to watch people doing things that they love to do and doing them so well and. Um, that's the thing that we hope for all of our viewers, all of our young explorers out there, we hope you find a path towards uh, finding the same kind of joy that I've been witnessing on the face of our science team and archaeology team. Uh, even in these solemn moments, even, even in the exploration of these historic and uh, tragic um, places, uh, there is uh, just a, a deep sense of, of satisfaction that comes with uh, bringing these stories um, back to life and uh, and I'm so thankful for getting to learn in their presence. So Thank you for that. One of the things we're looking down right now is the, the question is, there is definitely this bulkhead that you see coming up off of the deck is bent and curved. That's part of it. That, that is from it conforming to the bend as, of the hull itself as it moves back to the point of what we're also trying to ascertain is whether or not, in addition to that, there's any other, you know, bend or deformation. So, barely even this. Yeah, there we are. There's barely even So we are getting very close to the turn now. So Nautilus, with this, one of the things we're wanting to be doing, and again, understanding that at the turn we're getting close to the mud line. Just below the fair, just below the fair leads, and we're not quite there yet. But if we get closer towards the tip of the stern, what we're going to be looking for are the letters in the letter that tell the vessel's name. Can we uh, zoom in right there? Uh, that means that we're going to have to drop down. Yeah, you got it. To Can we zoom in? Yep, level. zooming. I, I, I think it's. It's also worth noting too. There, you know, this part of the ship staged multiple small boats, and the cradles were likely made out of wood that they sat in. Uh, they were V-shaped cradles along the keel, um, but in case they were something of a more permanent material that were sort of lashed or fastened to the deck, uh, it's good to keep an eye out for those as well. Just probably a little bit more inboard than here, but maybe still visible from the Sorry, out. we're having a lot of trouble hearing you. We're getting a tremendous amount of feedback again. Yeah, we're not quite sure, but but we're hearing that reverb here as well. Probably two mics open. So the second you've got mic. Got line, mm -hmm. got line, line here wrapped around these. There's, there's an open mic somewhere. It needs to be shut off. <laughs> I might have fixed it. <laughs> Thank okay, you, you, thank you, Silver Spring, and um, we did hear you. We did hear you well enough to hear that as we come to the stern. Oh, there's still echo. 
uh, we will be looking for the, the Japanese characters, the kanji characters um, that identify the ship as the Akagi. Want, want me to keep this zoom, Robert? No, you can zoom back out. Okay, coming out. So yeah, in the meantime, we've, uh, we're have we continuing 15 meters forward, or I guess aft towards the stern. Okay, yeah. So we're we're back again. Uh, that is not coming from us. Okay. Um, okay. One moment, thanks. One moment, thanks. So, so what we're seeing here, and I think you're seeing it too, and you can see it with the blowback, is the level of the mud is so high here that we may not actually see the ship's name. It's going to be further to the right uh, as we get right up close to the, the tip of the stern. Yes, you may not be able to get close enough to it without blowing up. Yeah, copy that. We definitely can see how high up that uh, the mud line is. Do we know what this other round structure is back here? Right up top there. Over there. Not entirely. That looks like a hole in the deck right next to it. Yeah. It looks mm -hmm. square. Looks like a hatch. Oh, so uh, one of our, our colleagues, John, thinks that uh, the the name would be like on the side of the stern, not necessarily the, the direct back like Yorktown was. But it looks like you only have like a meter of uh, yeah, I'm not sure we would, side sticking yeah. up out of the dirt. No, we, we agree with John. That's what it shows on the plan. Yeah, we just we're not sure we have enough uh, freeboard to see that, but we'll we'll see. The thing that we're noticing though is that the name on the stern on the plans is roughly at the same level as the casemate guns. So okay. if the mud is mounted up, okay. uh, it's it's the same level then it's entirely possible that we would see that once we cross down there. Yeah, the issue is just going to be if we can get the camera low enough. Right, I'm going to go Understood. ahead and... I just want you to remember how excited you were when we saw the independent. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't imagine. <laughs> I think I'll go ahead and uh, get us to start moving maybe 20 more meters that yeah. way. Looks like we should still be a little bit behind. Bridge now. Can we please move two zero meters at bearing zero three zero? Thank you. For viewers that are just tuning in, we are rounding the port stern corner of the IJN Akagi, um, Imperial Japanese Naval Aircraft Carrier from World War II um, that sank in the Battle of Midway. Uh, and looking for the Japanese kanji, the Japanese characters that would identify the ship, although I don't believe there's any doubt that that's the ship we're looking at, uh, just the opportunity to to honor this ship's story and, uh, and see those characters is, is what we're currently looking for. I believe we've been diving for uh, the last 10 hours or so. And um, we're here with ROV Atalanta 
uh, an incredible team of marine archaeologists, both in the control van and on shore at the Exploration Command Center. I know we were joined earlier by some of our Japanese marine archaeologist friends and colleagues as well. Not sure if they're on the line, but when they do come back, I, I hope we can get another round of introductions. And Silver Spring, whenever it suits you all, it, it'd be great for our viewers to know who they're, who they're listening to um, in case they're just tuning in. Online viewers, you can also find out more about our team at the Nautilus Live team tab. Um, you can also scroll down on Nautilus Live to see the, the team that's currently on watch, which I believe includes um, not only all my friends here on the 8 to 12 watch in the van, but, but also those who are on shore, um, both in Silver Spring, Maryland and in Japan. And you feel free, please send in your comments, your questions on Nautilus Live. We're glad you're here with us on this Sunday evening or Monday morning uh, in Japan. And uh, we truly have a global audience. And we're, we're thankful for all of you that are here, people tuning in from the United States and Japan, but also Germany, Australia, the Philippines, United Kingdom, Canada, Singapore, Poland, Norway, the Netherlands, Hong Kong, Hungary, France, Finland, the Czech Republic, of course, the uh, kingdom and nation of Hawaii as well, whose waters we're in here in Papahanao Mukuakea, ancestral waters to the Hawaiian people, foundational to their story and, and now so important to the stories of those Japanese and American servicemen and sailors who fought so bravely in this battle as enemies and uh, now arrive back at this sacred site as, as dear friends and allies. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Dan. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, thank you all who are joining us, especially our scientists, the uh, support ashore. Um, we are on the Ala Omoana Kaiuli expedition in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, we have been diving, as we said, uh, for the past, for over 10 hours, and you know, this place of pole, this place of darkness, is what we as Kanako Eevee believe is the world beyond. So beyond our living consciousness and the world that we um, are born into, then this is a place that we return to. It's a well akua, it's a place of our gods, um, our ancestors. Um, it's a place of our, you know, genealogical history. The Kumulipo is a 2000 lined uh, chant or oli and it connects us to this place, to these depths, through ko'a, through coral. And then in the Kumulipo, our genealogical um, creation story for Kanako Yivi, for Native Hawaiian people, uh, there are many similarities, and you can see the duality. Um, similarities within life form within the sea, marine life within the sea, and then life on land. Um, so there's always this intrinsic relationship that Native Hawaiians, Kanaka have, and then indigenous people around the world have. Uh, they're connected to their land. And as Tori Hunt, one of our other science communication fellows, had mentioned that cultural resources, or natural resources, are cultural resources. So I think as a young Native Hawaiian, as an indigenous woman, being able to sail here aboard Nautilus and come into this sacred space, um, it's a pilgrimage and it's a humbling journey for myself as an individual and learning alongside all of these greatly talented, skilled, and intelligent people. Um, we've had beautiful connections and conversations and I look forward to what else we'll learn along the way. Mahalo, Mahina. You know, as our um, Mahina and I have the a privilege and, and honor of sailing uh, together with, with a number of other crew members aboard the traditional Hawaiian and Polynesian voyaging canoes, Hokulea and Hikianalia, currently on a voyage, Moana Nuiakea. Mm -hmm. um, 
that uh, will circumnavigate the Pacific and and uh, do another sort of sacred pilgrimage, very similar uh, in a lot of ways, I think, spiritually and um, and in terms of the knowledge that we're seeking uh, to this mm -hmm. to this pilgrimage down to the depths here in Papahanaumokuakea. And we were just on uh, mm -hmm. on a call from the studio on board uh, with so many friends and crew members um, who are uh, gathering together on Oahu uh, that are part of that that voyage. And so it was great to see those these two voyages coming together, mm -hmm. um, honoring the the Pacific peoples and and how much they've been connected to and cared for this ocean for for so many thousands of years yeah most definitely and you know yep yep nautilus silver spring yep what we're seeing past that large circle is what appears to be an open patch yeah it's interesting because we're in an area where, of course, the rudder was jammed after that. The question is whether or not that open hatch is an indication of some of a desperate move by the crew to try to get that open and to get down there and start banging on things to try to get that rudder unstuck. Uh, it doesn't make sense. They would not have gone into combat with that thing open. So interesting thing here and just a, a, you know so we're not asserting anything it's just a question but seeing that open hatch could have popped off with striking the seabed could have popped off any other way but it also could have been open <laughs> yeah it makes sense jim yeah there we're right here yeah, I mean, that's the turn. yeah. Oh, I think it just all yeah 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 no, yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, there, it is. there they are there it is. Oh, wow. yep. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> you want me to come back out while you make that move? Okay. You heard that burst of excitement. Mike, you want to talk about what we were, what we think we just saw? Yeah, so we're kind of seeing the uh, the white outline of, of what is probably the name of the ship on the, the very side of the of the transom of this and the stern. Um, but we're, we need to uh, we need to get ourselves into a slightly better position to be able to look, look in and see if it's legible. It was on a significant heave, and <laughs> we just caught that sort of very quick glimpse, but it was pretty pronounced and obviously exciting for us. And as Jim and Silver Spring was helping all of us kind of imagine some of those final moments on board the ship, which of course is part of telling this story, is, is bringing it back to life and, and thinking about what those sailors, what those, uh, what those brave sailors were, were going through as they, as they tried to unfreeze, tried to tried to unlock the rudder of this vessel. Of course, as you mentioned, we don't know, um, but uh, part of the telling of the story is, is stepping into the realm of imagination and, and trying to start teasing out some of what could have happened. I think we might be seeing corrosion products of uh, either metal or the paint that was used for these letters. I don't know that, they're, that I can make out any legibility. I can push in a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, please. Further to this, by the way, John Parshall has just chimed in again. And, and for those of you who don't know, John is co-author of Shattered Sword along with Tony Tully, and they've joined, they've been with us through much of this dive. Here's from John. We know that an engineering crew would have attempted to unjam the rudder, and we also know that the ship started moving again for a brief time, so a damage control party was likely down there. Wow. Thank you, Jim and John. There is a chance that we'll be able to see the same pattern on the other side, okay. potentially. Okay. Okay. Again, it's more, with more modern wrecks, more often than not, when you're doing shipwreck work, you're trying to figure out what a vessel's identification is, and more often than not, we don't know. We can just assess the type. It's rare when the ship actually tells you its name. So this is a pretty important moment. 
in this exploration. Do you think, um, Bob, do you think we're going to drift out in front enough here to just cut straight across, or are we going to need to... Yeah? Okay. Again, for those tuning in, we're looking carefully and closely at the stern of the ship, port side of the stern of the ship, to um, to see if perhaps some of the markings on the side of the ship could be the, the Japanese characters, the kanji, identifying this as the IJN Akagi aircraft carrier. Um, really profound to hear Jim talk about how rare it is to have ships reveal their names to you in the depths. Um, you know, after 80 years, there's so much corrosion, there's so many things uh, growing on the surface of the ship, and of course this ship went through, took on tremendous battle damage during the Battle of Midway. Um, all of those factors uh, contribute to how difficult it is to get a clear look at a name. But the ship is revealing so much of its story to us. We just uh, we just heard about the, that engineering team that would definitely have gone down to uh, to free the rudder that was jammed um, in this same section of the vessel after it had taken on so much battle damage already. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and. Um get us to move maybe I'm thinking 20 meters across might get us just to the other side uh yeah that yeah. should work Do you, are we are we still going to be drifting to the right at all yeah we're kind of just coming to the very end of that so yeah, okay. another one or two meters yeah that, that's perfect okay thanks and we can zoom pull out is that good Robert okay for broader context on this Ala Amoana Kaiuli Expedition, NA-154 aboard Exploration Vessel Nautilus. Uh, we are out in Papahana Mokuakea um, under permit from the Marine National Monument um, to both explore these uh, significant archaeological sites and um, sacred places related to these battles of World War II. Um, well off of uh, Kwaihileni, well out in open ocean, um, but uh, in very deep water, over 5,300 meters deep. Uh, but also surveying throughout this expedition various sea mounts in the region, doing some really amazing geology and, and uh, biological surveys, benthic marine environments, and trying to unlock not just 80 years of history, but millions and tens of millions of years of history. I'm, I'm sitting just across the aisle from Val Finlayson, our uh, our uh, lead scientist, co-lead scientist, along with Mike, whose uh, specialty is uh, is geology of seamounts and their isotopic signatures. I, I may be getting some of that wrong because I just don't know. Oh, you're doing uh, fine. Nearly as much <laughs> as Val, but it's a it's a true privilege. Uh, I actually have a little bit of context on some of the uh, uh, abyssal plain geology that we're looking at too. Because, uh, as we can see, mud is a uh, an unavoidable uh, uh, feature in this dive. And I uh, went looking for some estimates of uh, sediment thickness in Pacific Abyssal Plains. Um, so, by my ru very rough estimate, uh, the oceanic crust around here uh, on this Abyssal Plain would be approximately 110 to 120 million years old, thereabouts. And uh, while there's no estimate of sediment thickness uh, local to where we are right now, um, there are a couple of estimates that have been published, uh, actually a couple of measurements that have been published uh, north and west of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, that northern measurement is over some uh, approximately 80 million year old uh, oceanic crust. Wow. And, that, um, uh, and on top of that is going to be uh, no more than about 50 meters of uh, pelagic sedimentation. At the western site, where the oceanic crust is estimated to be about 129 million years old, uh, it's quite a bit thicker, and uh, uh, measurements from that area uh, 
uh, come back as about 300 to 1,000 meters of sediment cover. So we're somewhere in between those, with this crust being somewhere between 110 and 120 million years old. Wow. So this, it's quite thick sediments here, not as thick as what you'll find in some parts of uh, the Atlantic Basin, but um, that explains why uh, uh, these these uh, shipwrecks are uh, partially buried in the mud. Buried in the it's mud. Quite thick. Pelagic sedimentation, otherwise known as muck, uh, <laughs> yes. is deep here in this in this part of the ocean, and because of its how old it is, it's been collecting for uh, millennia. Upon it's really really amazing, and um, and so we we aren't able to see you know that draft of the ship, sort of the the, the deeper parts of the of the hull are buried, um, and we were even wondering if we would be able to see. Uh, up to the height of where these kanji might be. We weren't right. sure. Um, so it is buried quite deeply. Some people are curious, Mike or Silver Spring, I'm not sure if folks have modeled um, these kinds of shipwrecks before and their descents from surface to seabed, but we do have folks who are, are curious, as you would expect, on how long it would take a ship like this and, and at what kind of speed uh, would it come settling down um, into this pelagic sedimentation, also known as muck. <laughs> yeah, that, it's been modeled um, for Titanic, um, but that that uh, sinking process was a little bit more complex because it broke in two pieces. Um, I don't have an exact answer, but it sank faster than slower. Like it, it didn't take like hours. It probably was under an hour to sink this this depth. Um, I would expect. Um, I mean, it's 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 shaped to be hydrodynamic, right? So sinking by the it did actually sink by the bow. Um, so it probably cut through and it probably did not sink straight down it probably sank at a at an angle because the bow would have it moving uh through the water um, and we saw that with the uss nevada which um did break into pieces the, the stern was broken off but the the main hull um drifted and and uh was a similar depth to this uh but it um it was it was a, about I don't know, six, six or seven hundred meters away from the de the debris field from where it was uh, sunk, uh, that the main hull landed. So so hulls will continue to cut through the water even as it's doing a vertical descent instead of a horizontal traverse. Are we um, just for just this rough context and estimate so people can sort of wrap their heads around it? Are we talking about like single digits in miles per hour or knots, or are we talking about double digits uh, likely? Um, their speed as they as they uh, descend. I, I really can't. Yeah, not, I not sure. I don't know. Not sure. Yeah. Cool. And that's always okay too. Part of the exploration. Yes, Silver Spring. There's been some modeling done for some of the deep water sites. Rob Church had worked on some of that as well. Uh, it's difficult to say, you know, with the descent of Akagi, if it would have matched what its speed would have been when you know, under full full steam. But the dead weight of this thing being pulled down would have in clearly it's going down bow first as to whether it sank even or tilted to one side, hard to say. What we do see in the sonar is the water that's displaced by the movement of the hull ultimately hits the seabed first. Uh, that kind of signature is present on Titanic and other sites, and then this thing would have hit. Clearly what we've seen is evidence of plowing into the seabed. One of the questions we have is while we saw a certain amount of sediment displaced off on the port side, uh, if that same type of displacement is present on the starboard side, because sometimes when these things hit, they don't just plow straight in, they, they tend to slide, in some cases slide sideways, and that was one of the things we saw with Nevada. With that as well, uh, sometimes the ships will right themselves when they sink, even if they capsize. Uh, certainly, you know, Bismarck capsized as it went down and hit the seabed right side up. Nevada did not. Nevada rests on the seabed having plowed in, but it is bottom up. Uh, so, again, the more work we do, the more of these sites that we see and look at better we understand the processes behind them. Every bit of data that we collect is important. Absolutely. Jim, I was especially um, 
interested and, and intrigued in the conversation we had while looking at the USS Yorktown on really trying to, with, with all of you in Silver Spring, about um, understanding the journey that ships take on their way from ship to shipwreck and, and not only what happens on descent, but, but what happens to these ships uh, over time as they rest on the seafloor. And, um, and I think that's uh, what an incredible opportunity to, um, to sort of gain those insights uh, from, this, from this really hollowed ground, from this really, from this really important historical site. We can uh, start unwrapping a lot of science and, and start, uh, start really figuring out how some of these, some of these stories are unfolding. There's uh, the writings there as well. Oh, wow. If you're watching with us, we're just coming over to the starboard side of the stern where it looks like we're going, we may be gifted with uh, the okay. sharing of, of uh, this, this ship's Sorry. name, this vessel's name. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to, to Mike and the, and the team ashore as if whatever they want to share as we walk through this walk through this experience yeah we're just seeing if we can get a get a legible reading so we were told um, by uh, by our colleague Asako who's who's in uh, Japan that if it's three characters it, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's hiragana instead of kanji um, and this this would mean um, or the, the name Akagi meant um, Red Castle, and it was named for a province in Ganju, I believe. It still looks like, I wonder if it was like, um, like painted over patches of paint, you know what I mean? And that we're just seeing the, the undercoat that, that, that may be like. Almost like they were on plates or something yeah, that, that exactly. came off. Yeah, Cause it, it's like, if it were just the letters, I wouldn't expect to see square squares here. Um, I mean, it's almost like someone duct taped over them, you know. But I think I think they may have been painted onto these patches that we can't see. Can we get any more zoom on that? This is a better yeah. angle than the last one. You know, the U.S. Navy during the war would often, often you know, paint out the name and number and things so as a as a security matter. It's possible the Japanese did that too to you know hide the identity of the ship from the enemy. That, That's what it that looks, looks like. Deliberate. Hmm. That does look, yeah, they painted right over it. Oh, wow. So, so that's, there's another thing that we hadn't known before. We that think that they, they painted over it? Yep. Oh, when? That's the, that's the, it wasn't yeah. the mermaids. <laughs> yeah, at what point did they paint over it then? I believe Akafume is, is connected with us. Perhaps you could share. Oh, that would be great. Oh yeah, I think I see the embossed. Um, Asaka pointed it out because she sent what the uh, what the wor what the characters would be, and I think it's backwards from what she sent. But I think I can make out the embossed uh, A uh, on the right one. Yeah, almost like the paint underneath yeah. is, or like mm -hmm. the symbol underneath is eroding. It was embossed, but this. Yeah, I so I can see. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we agree we see there's shapes in the yeah. paint below the paint. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yep, I see it. It's coming in at just the right angle when yeah. the lights produce that little shadow. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Very nice. It's a trough. It's got a it's got a Portal, portal. It's portal. Specifical on four quarter. Let the drain, yeah, the Akafume, if you're there with us, we'd love to uh, hear any thoughts as we look here at the name.
this um, this feels especially sacred and important and just want to honor the vessel and all of those who sailed on this vessel and the lives they lived on this vessel as it's revealing its name to us, although not totally deliberately. Looks like the story might be that there was an attempt to paint over the name, but such an honor to bear witness to this. Hi, this is Jun Kimura from Japan. Um, yes, if between uh, hiragana character, not kanji, then um, it has three characters. In, uh, but um, uh, one of the square is not real square. That's um, I have a curiosity about it. Um, so if it's kanji, um, it, it should be two characters. Yeah, thank you. It's, so it should be the uh, hiragana? Yes. Yeah. So John Parshall yeah. just chimed in and he said, you can see, and what we're seeing is we're seeing the marks through the paint. So both um, Asako has noted this, and, and John as well. You can see the the A, you can see Ka, and then Gi. So the double mark, yeah. So we're and the Sako's mother also agrees <laughs> that it's an A, which is cool. Uh, That's awesome. So, uh, so the most left side that has um, a little bit awkward shape must be G, uh, pronounced in G I, and there's a small um, square notches picking up. Um, because of the sound that has um, uh, something to dot on, on pronunciation of yi. So I think uh, from right side to left side, akagi in three characters in hiragana. Oh, thank you. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you very much. Mahalo nui for joining us. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Asako, arigato. Arigato zaima. All right, I think we can come uh, full wide, if you don't mind. I hope all the viewers at home also just feel the, the power and privilege of, of sitting in between our American and Japanese colleagues working so closely as good friends um, and as experts in their field together to, um, to help us see this story and bear witness to this um, historic ship resting here, 5,300 meters deep in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, just north of Koihilani or Midway Atoll. All right. Yeah, I was just getting a little bearing here. All right. Thanks, everyone. That was um, that was great to be able to see even through the paint. Um, yeah, it, it is I worth waiting up. So yeah. I didn't catch all the conversation there. So it's confirmed. Yeah. So we can see the embossed characters through the through the white paint, and um, uh, Asako sent what it should look like. So that was the only reason that I was able to make out that it is in fact the embossed like raised uh, letters are, are still still visible. So we got the A uh, on the right. Ka and Gi uh, on the left. Um, so what we're what we're gonna do now is um, kind of similar to what we did uh, previously. We're gonna try to stay along this deck edge and lateral. Um, however, keep in mind that after the first I don't, mm, ten or thirty meters, we're gonna have to rise up because the uh, the flight deck it's is gonna be. Over on this side? Uh, I don't think too much. Okay, so maybe 20 meters and we can see how yeah. it looks there? Yeah, right. so we're going to hit the edge of the hangar deck uh, that we're starts. We're going to try and avoid doing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're going to visually hit the hangar deck. Um, and It's going to be kind of a wall there. And the flight deck would have come out over it, but I don't think it's there anymore. And then we'll rise up to meet the, uh, the top of the hangar deck okay. and continue to lateral. Cool. Um, and at a few points, once we get moving, I'm going to have us drop down to look at, see if we can find torpedo damage. Uh, as well as those casemate guns on this side. Okay. 
Okay. Sounds good. All right. Bridge nav. So I apologize for the move very slow. Two zero follow? meters at bearing two two zero. Yes, you were saying? Okay, I just wanted to make sure yeah, yeah. I got that in. Um, yeah, I apologize for the really slow follow-up here because it took a little bit to find, but there was some talk <laughs> about uh, like terminal velocities of sinking vessels. Yeah. And awesome. yeah, I'm finding uh, some papers that are uh, putting some estimates of uh, uh, sinking velocities somewhere in the ballpark of uh, eight to 10 uh, meters per second. I don't oh. know how accurately that translates to this yeah. uh, instance, but um, that gives you an idea of approximately how fast this yeah, may well, have sunk. And Virginia found, drum roll. Ah? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I did. Um, it was, uh, I did find online that uh, the Titanic, they think it sank from the surface to the seafloor in five to 10 minutes. Which puts it at about 35 miles per hour. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that is not, that, that's not much, I was saying under an hour, but I was, yeah. that's, a, that's a lot faster than I thought. Yeah. Right. Um, However, I could not find many more articles supporting that. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it's still, it's still mm -hmm. somewhere to base it on, right? It still gives us yeah. a, like oh, a, a scale. It's like, we know it didn't sink, a, didn't take a day. Right. 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 Um, so it's, it, it's a sense of scale. It was pretty quick, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is why we see so much sediment plowed up. Yeah, and uh, with the uh, with the uh, the area of uh, uh, you know that, that basically got cratered out by yeah. this impact yeah, sure. uh, would indicate that this one was moving pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah, cause I'm I'm having a little trouble finding information on this too, mm -hmm. and most of what I found is behind a paywall that I can't get through <laughs> right. at the moment. So I'm uh, I'm I'm looking for everything I can find. Well, it's mm -hmm. a it's a very theoretical. Thing, and I'm not sure a lot yeah. of people have wanted to put the time into doing that other than with Titanic because it's, it, you know, it's, it's it's very theoretical. There's no way to test it. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like there's some scaled, like some scaled tests that people have done in labs and some calculations based yeah. on the size of the debris field or the mm -hmm. impact area. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it looks kind of tricky because a lot of this is empirically derived. Um, yeah, not not a lot of practical modeling that I can see. And yeah. you know, you have scaled stuff. Compartments and those are failing and imploding at random depths and stuff, right? Yeah, there's there's certainly a lot of uh, complexity to it. Yeah, it's because mm -hmm. air is going to be pushed out as uh, as as the pressure increases. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that as well. Yeah, and it can be really hard to kind of scale from like a a small uh, lab model of a process like this up to um, something. Uh, uh, on this scale, you know, there's, there's always some uh, estimates and assumptions that are made. So it's a, it, it's an easy number to think about, but a hard one to actually determine. Mm. Mahalo, Dr. Val. We had many viewers uh, wondering, so <laughs> I think you answered a lot of questions and provided a lot of clarity for us all. Oh, uh, Virginia too. Oh, so, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Mahalo, Virginia. Yeah, and, uh, well, it's, yeah, it's not a it's not a very definite answer, and uh, between what uh, Virginia and I found, it's uh, it's a pretty big uh, range there. So um, I hope that provides some context, but yeah, it's really difficult to pin down. No, I th I think that that provides the level of of information that we needed. Like we needed to know the scale. Was it ten minutes? Was it an hour? Was it a day? You know, then that that certainly provides that it was very fast, relatively. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, just the, the side scan shows us it was a very energetic impact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mike, I actually have a question for you from one of our viewers tuning in. Uh, they were just wondering about the area surrounding um, the wreck and if there would have been more aircraft littered around this area. So uh, we were thinking that uh, we would we would be able to look out for that. Um, but uh, John Parcell, who um, W wrote one of the the books on on the battle uh, indicated that there were only two zeros, which are the Japanese fighter planes, uh, on the vessel at the time that the bomb struck. Um, and we, even so, with such a a fire that raged across the entire ship, they probably w the aluminum parts would have all melted. Mm -hmm. So chances are that there's not much of a chance of finding an aircraft remaining on site. Okay, Mahalo. Thank you for that. You gotta move on? Yep.
Okay, and yeah, Virginia, you found 35 miles per hour, right? Yeah. Yeah, the estimate was um, five to 10 minutes, and then there was more information that I did not memorize. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I just realized we were talking in very different units because right. I, I was Use looking at meters per second. Yeah, eight so meters per I just, second is really fast. Yeah, I just uh, <laughs> ran a quick conversion on that, and that's almost 18 miles per hour. Yeah. So that is, that's yeah. actually a pretty decently constrained range yeah. <laughs> through a couple of different sources. All right. I, All right. I really can't, I can never Two get more. my head around meters per second. I know miles per hour because I drive a car, but. Meters per second, I'm just like, ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I've had to switch between the two a bunch for various yeah. physics classes, so. Yeah. Um, it, it, they, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard conversion to make in your head. Well, it's not just, it's just, a, a, I can't picture, like, I guess moving one meter per second. Like, I don't know, it's just, it's harder to picture for me the miles per hour because I can, I can understand, like, a car going by me at 20 versus a car going by me at 60. Like, I understand. Yeah. The level of speed we're talking about it's makes like sense. It's fast to walk, right? Yeah. yeah. If I oh, I'd like to say thank you to the team. Um, the identification of possible position of three characters uh, uh, definitely is a moment, and I was very impressed. And I was not sorry, not Kiryu, not Kaga, but um, it, um, it is um, Akagi, and. Um, number of uh, reconstruction of um, Akagi uh, in design and models. They don't reflect this information, the position of the names. And this is quite uh, important information that successful archaeological data extracted from this expedition. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you um, for saying that. I, it, is, it is great to, to be able to, to completely confirm with the name as well as, well as the uh, the construction and, and and I appreciate you saying that. Uh, we're glad that you are able to join in. Just want to share. We have a, a chat uh, where many of our scientists ashore are, are participating, and and uh, one of our scientists shares as a person who has literally had dreams about this ship since she is my favorite. IGN carrier, you cannot imagine how amazing this is to witness. And for those who for many years have been working towards planning and attempting at, uh, at seeing this ship, Akagi, which is being seen today, um, imaged like this for the very first time by ROV Atalanta. Uh, this, this sort of long-spanning international cooperation and, and scientific and archeological endeavor um, thank you to everyone who's put so much work in over the years. <laughs> Again, just feel so lucky to uh, to have been invited into this space in between and and uh, along this thread. So what a what a treat to bear witness to Akagi and and uh, all that it means to so many people. I think we were also reminded to um, on one of our previous dives for the USS Yorktown that the m service men and women who were on this ship also celebrated um, holidays, birthdays. They had a life on this ship. They worked, served on it, um, as well as sacrificed for it and for their nation. So it is really humbling to see this uh, this footage for the first time and to share this experience with all of you in the control van, ashore, and around the world. So mahalo, thank you for tuning in. While we're waiting to get set up here, I just want to take a second and uh, just acknowledge that so this expedition is uh, funded by the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration and Research through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. Uh, we have just here on board uh, 32 scientists, students, and engineers representing 17 institutions, including the University of Maryland, Search Inc., NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, University of Hawaii at Manoa, University of Hawaii at Hilo, University of New Hampshire, University of Rhode Island, University of California, Los Angeles, University of California, Long Beach, University of Louisiana at Lafayette, Florida State University, University of South Florida, Seattle University, 
Palau International Coral Reef Center, Guam Coral Reef uh, Initiative, Purple Maya Foundation, Concord High School, uh, and of course the Ocean Exploration Trust. And that's just here on board uh, in Exploration Command Center joining us. We have audio at, or in their home institutions, we have a uh, couple dozen uh, folks representing various institutions, including NOS, Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, Search Inc., Naval History and Heritage Command, Air Sea Heritage Foundation, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, uh, via the Henry Jackson Foundation, Nautilus Inc., Azul Mar International Midway uh, Memorial Foundation, Tokyo University, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, uh, Tokai University. And that's just the people you hear on the audio and the chat we have for this expedition alone, over 100 individuals from government, non-government, academic, and private sector. Uh, mahalo to you all. And last but certainly not least, the privilege to do this work uh, uh, through a permit authorized by NOAA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the State of Hawaii, and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. That's uh, it's always good to uh, to show how how collaborative this this expedition is. So touching that none of this could happen without each and every one of those people. Thank you for naming them. Those expressions of gratitude coming from familiar voices, Daniel Wagner, Megan Cook, our co-expedition leaders, um, who have done so much to uh, to ensure the, that this expedition could happen. So while they they know that it's a collaborative effort better than most, and, and they know how important everyone is, it's it's wonderful to have great leadership guiding us into these waters, and and we appreciate the both of you very much. Yes, mahalo, Megan and Daniel, our expedition leads, our expedition alaka'i. Um, you have both just carried your kuleana, your responsibility, with such grace and stillness and wisdom, um, carefully making decisions and leading the team cautiously through these waters, navigating archaeological sites, such as the one that the past two dives and then um, even our previous dive. So it has been a privilege. Uh, working with you folks and learning with you too. So mahalo to Megan Cook and Dag Wag er, Daniel Wagner. Kalamai. Yeah, Mahina and I were talking just, uh, I think it was just yesterday or maybe the day before with a, a group of students um, from Waimea, from Kanuokaina, <laughs> and uh, just reflecting on the most important roles on a, on a va'a, on a yeah. va'a kaulua, or voyaging kanu, mm -hmm. or on an exploration vessel. And uh, while well, we did have to say that the cooks might come in first, um, it was uh, it was the uh -huh. captains and navigators. It was the expedition leaders, the alaka'i, mm -hmm. who had to carry so many decisions. Who's uh, everyone is vital. Um, yeah. We have pillows downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> say you are mission critical. I love those pillows oh, yes. uh, in the lounge because it's true for everyone. But uh, yeah, it's uh, amazing to see everyone filling their role so masterfully from navigators to rov pilots video engineers our science team our data loggers just mm -hmm. quietly over there kukui <laughs> uh, our little light just typing away <laughs> um, logging all of this footage and making sure the science can continue um, for years and decades to come um, to mahina um, yep. bringing such critical cultural perspective and uh, and sensibility and knowledge of this place as someone who's genealogically tied and connected to it and a great communications team so uh, and that is just the people on board as Daniel pointed out so many amazing folks um, participating in this so and we also have this wonderful ships crew who are uh, keeping the engines going mm -hmm. not going anywhere without those guys yeah they're nope. doing an amazing amazing job here on board and uh, we're so thankful yeah, on every vessel, whether it's a Va'akaulua traditional Hawaiian sailing canoe or an exploration vessel such as the Nautilus, every single person on board is critical. They all have a kuleana responsibility 
and each person carries that responsibility throughout the day and throughout the entirety of the mission or the expedition or the voyage. Um, so every single person, you know, working together. In Hawaii, we say it's a kako thing, it's an everybody thing, and it's a laulima effort, which means, laulima is, means that there's many hands involved. And, you know, as Daniel had mentioned before, that there are many partners involved. Um, you know, this, this was a process getting up until this point, being able to execute this. And it even took uh, a weather window, cooperation with the weather, um, you know, which determined if we were going to be able to safely go down here with ROV Atalanta. So many different parts at play, uh, cultural unity, collaboration around the world. Um, so we we're just really humbled to be a part of this experience and to be here on board. The clouds, the wind, the waves, the depths, the currents, Kanaloa in its entirety, and Kane as well, mm -hmm. Papahanao Mokuakea, yes. uh, gifting us with this uh, reve revelation, mm -hmm. bringing us a Kagi uh, out of the depths. Um, yeah, cannot forget uh, probably the greatest mahalo comes to, comes for, mm -hmm. comes for our ocean and, and our planet that's uh, keeping us safe out here and allowing us to explore. Most definitely, yeah. Mike or uh, uh, yeah, hold on one second. Nav, how is the uh, how's our move going? So yeah, I, I got us uh, kind of preemptively continuing that move. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I see kind of up here on the sonar that maybe how that over taller. yeah that hang yeah. over you're talking about my uh, yeah, big coming up. Some of that yeah. Out yeah. Maybe in like 25 meters. So I think by the time we settle out, we'll be pretty close to that. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And I was just going to ask Mike or uh, folks who are over in Maryland or in Japan, what we as we move up the starboard side, um, what viewers might expect to see, what we're what we're uh, anticipating, looking for, looking at in this uh, next move or two. Yeah. So this um, we're going to be doing the same thing we just did on the on the port side. We're going to be looking along the deck edge, uh, the flight deck and the hangar deck, um, looking at that some some of the the damage there and what remains of it. Um, to get an idea of, of some of the collapse, but we're also going to be looking, so the starboard side is the side that the four Japanese destroyers uh, fired torpedoes at to scuttle the ship. Um, so I, I'm fairly certain that uh, a lot of that's going to be buried in the mud, but we're going to drop down in a few places as we go along to see if we can see any evidence of that of in the, you know, the hull, holes in the hull from, uh, from the torpedo damage like we did uh, on Yorktown uh, yesterday. That's right. Um, we're probably only going to go, we're not going to go all the way to the bow, but we'll probably go maybe three quarters of the way uh, because we covered some of that uh, at the beginning of the dive. And then we're going to come up uh, and look at the top of the flight deck and look for the, uh, the I'm sure that the bomb damage is, is has been eradicated by other burning and, and damage, but we're going to look at the condition of the uh, flight and hangar deck. Great, thank you. Thank Over you. the next like 36 hours. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it will be slow. We are moving patiently. Uh, I know our our navigator Catalina, who's doing an amazing job. She's she's commented how she just sometimes wishes she could just give the line a tug and make it move a little <laughs> bit faster. She's yeah. she's strong enough to do it, but uh, <laughs> it's just not how it works. So um, we have to be patient, and uh, and uh, the ROV pilots and and. And our navigators are working so well together, as with, along with the bridge, to keep the ROV safe in the safe and, and right position, best position for for viewing the ship. And um, John Parshall is uh, mentioning that um, the flight deck support aft of the bulkhead is completely gone, which the part that we're, you see the bottom or the middle of the screen, uh, there's like a curve up of the of the the deck there. Um, yep. That that was the uh, Tower, yeah. that's the curved bulk hole, bu bulkhead, and the flight there was a, a support for the flight deck that's completely missing. So the flight deck would have been above us. So just um, a vertical beam that would have been going straight up there and yeah. holding the flight deck in position. So the flight deck went almost all the way to the stern. So that's completely gone, um, and that would have been so above is us. Is that one of the supports there? Looking at uh, um, there might it might be some debris from it, but uh, the, the support tower is completely gone. Wow. That would have been a, be a little bit behind us, actually, that first, uh, or not even the first, but one of the supports. The other one was gone, Looks too. Like a, Mike, Looks like a starboard side casemate gun. Yep. Mike, we've got another 8-inch gun. Yep, we see it. 
We have another, uh, if that didn't come through clearly for you listening in, we have another eight inch gun here on the starboard side. So we were also given a uh, story in science chat about um, one of the soldiers, uh, one, of, one of the uh, folks uh, who sailed on Akagi. Uh, the youngest casualty of this battle is 15 year old third class seaman Suchia Ryosaku, who died aboard Akagi. He was four months shy of his 16th birthday when he perished. Oh my gosh. It was uh, such a time in our world's history. Mm -hmm. um, can't imagine being 15 years old and, and out at sea. Serving. Away yeah. from home, yeah. serving, serving your country and, and uh, knowing knowing you were going to face the kind of uh, the kind of battle kind of environments that these ships were facing they were these were uh, highly innovative these uh, this kind of warfare was uh, i know mike and our archaeologist team can speak more to this but you know this this kind of naval and air warfare was uh, uh, was being in some ways tested um, you know on this scale for the first time Mike also shared how the ship was scuttled. Uh, it was it was sank intentionally by the Japanese. So it was Japanese torpedoes, even though it took a lot of battle damage, uh, severe battle damage. Um, the Japanese uh, torpedoed Akagi uh, to send it to these depths um, before evacuating the ship. But of course, there were folks in the course of the battle who who were no longer alive when it was time to evacuate and. Mm -hmm. including folks as young as 15. Yeah. But Nautilus Shore Party, we also seeing, we have an answer to an earlier question, and that was whether or not the, the bend that we were seeing here was it's a result like of that near miss. Right here. It would not have been because yeah. the bend that we just are passing here now is the same bend on the other side, okay, and uh, John Parshall has told us yeah, that, uh, and it's very clear here, you know, visually as we look at it. We've also just passed the remains of a lattice structure upon which one of the Carly floats or life rafts for Akagi would have been stowed. The stubs of that yeah, have survived, and now we're also coming up on the second. Uh, eight inch gun in its casemate. Oh, thank you, John and Silver Spring, for, uh, for continuing to bring this Akagi shipwreck back to life for us and identifying its parts and the stories of damage. Thank you, Val, for sharing that story so from the science like we chat as well. To the top of the Welcome. Deck now, huh? I think we are about settled out here, um, and I believe if we keep on a similar heading, we should clear that kind of area that was jutting out. If that's okay. another 20 meters that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are we facing inward right now? Kind of at an angle. Yeah, we're about 20 degrees in. Got two more guns after that. That could also be sticking out. Catalina, if you if you didn't hear Silver Spring, there there could be a few more guns that are okay. also sticking out as we move forward. Yeah, we had to come up because uh, yep. the yeah, right deck's right here. But it, you're alright with that bearing and just coming up when we get there. Yeah. Okay. Bridge now. Can we move two zero meters? We got at bearing two one six. Three guns total. So one more to go. Thank you, Silver Spring. Sorry, one more what? One more one more gun to pass. Yeah, one. I think because we, we had to come up. I think I saw it in the distance when we were down lower. But I think we're too high to see it. They, they were letting us know that there are three three total. Yeah, and I think I'm looking straight down the muzzle of one, number yeah, two. Yeah, that's right what down. it looks like to us as well, yeah. Yeah, we had to come up to clear the 
deck here, so it's, it's down below us. Robert, I asked you this question on the Yorktown, how it compared to so many of your other dives, long career exploring the deep ocean, uh, coming on to IJ and Akagi today and and piloting over the last couple of hours. How does this, how do, I know, I know you're going to say, well, well, it'd be better if we had little Hercules, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, besides, besides that, how does, how does this feel? How does this compare for someone who's seen so many, so many yeah, uh, things done? We spent a month surveying the, the, the wreck of the Derbyshire, doing the same sort of thing, flying with, uh, oh, that was, uh, um, I forget, it wasn't Medea. Anyway, a sister vehicle to this one. And, um, so this is pretty similar to that. That was broken up into a lot of pieces, though. It spread over like a two kilometer area. Mm -hmm. Broken up all the way, on the way down. No matter what, what Robert's doing in the deep sea, it feels like home, I guess. He's, he's done it all. He's uh, been well, down here for a long time. I don't want to be buried at sea, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, Roger. I want to be in the mountains. I guess I'll end up in the sea eventually, but <laughs> I get to see some stuff on the way. <laughs> eventually into the sea via the sky. That's very poetic. <laughs> We do have a number of viewers who are curious about, you know, they're always looking forward. Uh, it's hard to, it's hard to stay present and and be fully immersed when you're taking this in just through a screen and and uh, we're moving so slow. People want to know what other, what other wrecks uh, might we get to see um, from the Battle of Midway, and uh, of course, of course, we we don't know because that depends on so many other factors, but. Uh, um, Mike or others, do we want to talk a little bit about the other context of the battle and, and what other what other vessels are out here in this sort of general area, this corner of Papahanaumokuakea as a result of of Midway? I know you've, you've told the story many times, probably each of you, but for those viewers who are just tuning in. Yeah, so there's uh, there were seven ships sunk in total. Uh, we dived on USS Yorktown yesterday, uh, and USS Hammond was a destroyer that was sunk in the same torpedo attack from uh, from the Japanese submarine I-168. Um, and so that wreckage is nearby, but not adjacent to, to Yorktown. Uh, so we weren't able to go look for it. Um, but then there were five Japanese uh, ships sunk. There were four aircraft carriers. This one, uh, Akagi, as well as Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu. Uh, and then a light cruiser, Maku Makuma? That doesn't sound, Mizuma? Um, was sunk uh, later on uh, after after the initial um, aerial battle. Thank you, thank you, Mike. We do have uh, some more really interesting. Uh, information coming in from our, our Science Ashore team. John shared that there's an amazing Japanese book by a woman named Sawachi Hasai, uh, forgive me if that's a poor pronunciation, that has the name, rank, birth, birth province, and age at time of death of every one of the 3,057 Japanese who perished during the battle, and all of the Americans as well. It's an astonishing piece of research. And... Uh, just that that information alone, just a just a reminder of how solemn and sacred this place is. All of these wrecks that Mike was talking to us about, this entire battle, considered a historic turning point in the war. Um, but maybe more importantly, just just a very human resting place, a place uh, place that's so sacred. No matter which side you look at it from, uh, we're so. So honored to be here and humbled to be here. Thank you for mentioning the book. Yes, Miku Sawachi uh, lately published this book. And um, there was a series of interviews of the family of the crew in both sides, actually. And, um, there was um, um, 
some ongoing research on the midway battle steers in, happens in Japan. And um, this ex expedition certainly provides a new perspective to the current ongoing research. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I think this here is the uh, the edge of the, the remaining flight deck. So, so from here to the stern, it, it's uh, missing. I think this is the first. Well, it's either the flight deck or just below at the hangar deck, or like no, I think it is the flight deck. Um, but it does look peeled back here, or or just missing its uh, its wooden top. So these are these are gun mounts here, though. Yeah, you can see the yeah. the, the anti aircraft gun at the very bottom in that gun tub, the semicircle there. there that's a gun yeah. there. That's an anti aircraft gun. Very similar to the Yorktown there. Yeah, they're similar in in uh, in style. Um, and so there's in? sure yeah, there's going to be a couple of these. Um, and then we're going to come to one of the larger guns that we first dropped down, similar to the ones that we first dropped down on. Up on this deck level? Yeah. John's uh, pointing out that's a 96 mount for the anti-aircraft gun. Yeah. The directors in between. And June, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Arigatou Jim, when you say the directors in between, what do you, what's, what's, what are those? Uh, the, the gun directors for stage, if you see, if you zoom out, it's the um, four reflective piece of metal that was used to trigonomically right. measure distances and and help guide the anti-aircraft okay. yeah, fire. And they're in between the mounts. So oh, I see. Are just optical or do they have radar guided guns? Optical, as I recollect. So pretty soon as we keep going along this, we may very well start to see the landing light arrays, which would have been on the edge of the flight deck if this is preserved and not Coming out. Mounted. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is, so this is the lattice, I think, that underlaid the... Uh, the flight deck. So is that a piece of wood that's still on top of that lattice, or what is that? It could be, it, it may be wood, it may be just like a light uh, metal co coating, covering the, that the wood was attached to. Okay. There's a ladder there, going down from the flight deck mm -hmm. to the to the mm -hmm. hangar deck. Mm -hmm. Couple more guns there. Mike was only slightly exaggerating earlier when he said we'd be down here for another 36 hours, uh, but it's, uh, I think we, we are expecting, anticipating being on the bottom for, for another eight or nine. Right? Yeah, we'll be, we plan to be come off bottom at uh, 0700. 0700 Hawaii standard time. So uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of exploration left. Uh, just incredible to be given the conditions and, and opportunity to spend so much time down here with Akagi. Let's just also come back to us. He's put up in the chat, he's put up a drawing of the gun gallery that, you know, we're currently hovering over yep. with, uh, the, with the smaller optical directors between the gun tubs. So this is like an unshielded type 95. Yeah, it looks like a metal covering there that probably was between this lattice and the, the wood deck, wooden deck. Okay, thanks. Are there many models or drawings or paintings of the ship that are available for uh, for public viewers to see? Oh, uh, there, there, oh yeah. I have this book of 3D drawings here, but there, yeah, there's, um, if you Google the plans or the drawings of Akagi, um, you, you will come up with uh, there's quite a quite a few drawings that, that you can see, and um, yeah, try to do what we're doing and try to match up things that you see on the screen <laughs> to, right. to parts of the wreck. It's, or parts of the ship. It's a it's a very complicated puzzle. 
And John's just saying, yeah, both the mounts and the directors were unshielded. So uh, 1930s, 1935? Yeah. All right, do we want to continue along? Yes, here? please. Yeah. Um, let's keep about a similar <laughs> bearing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John. I just saw that in the chat. Yeah. Great, so enough. Get John's book if you want to see all those. <laughs> All those images. He, sh he should. He should type in his ISBN number. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty yeah. funny. For those of you out there, uh, we are very fortunate to be joined by historians John Parshall and Tony Tully, whose book Shattered Sword is a tour de force history, the battle, but in particular draws not only. It, it draws from both sides and with an incredible amount of detail and references and, and, and human history from from both sides. Uh, we've got it here uh, with us. It is the must-have resource. If you really want to know about this battle, buy their book. And we're very fortunate to have them both here. And <clears throat> those of you in the public that are hearing, in our Science, we have a chat line where uh, <laughs> we got a chat line. So it's ISBN nine seven eight one five seven four eight eight three nine. Yes, that's great. Oh. It's fantastic. Our operators are standing by. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I have not uh, I have not played the game but uh, there is a from what I understand kind of a a free online naval game called World of Warships um, some of our viewers are interested in and and some of uh, replicas or models of Akagi and Kaga and, and many of the other ships um, the sunk at the Battle of Midway are kind of characters um, in World of Warship, so I, I haven't, I haven't vetted or stepped into that space at all. But uh, interesting ways, different kinds of ways to interact with this story and bring this story back to life. And we appreciate the dedicated, dedicated research that goes into creating, creating these books. Uh, can help us remember and uh, better understand what took place over those days and weeks and longer. Move. We are, yeah. We are ended, or are we? No, it just started. It started, no, yeah. No. So in case any of our viewers have just joined us, uh, we are located right now in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument in the North Central Pacific. And we are currently uh, doing a video only uh, deep dive on uh, the IJN uh, Akagi, which was a uh, Japanese carrier uh, lost uh, after the uh, Battle of Midway in 1942.
And this is actually the uh, first ever dive on this wreck. It was uh, located using side scan sonar back in 2019. And uh, we are for the first time uh, documenting this wreck in detail. Well, we're kind of on top of it right here, so. I can try and lateral over, but I don't know if I'm gonna get very far. That's right, Val. It's so so interesting to me to get to witness such interdisciplinary research, you know, because this expedition is taking place over four weeks, um, and Papahanao Mokuakea is so rich biologically, geologically, culturally, archaeologically. Um, there's there's so many aspects and dimensions. So, you know, we have uh, we still have a couple more weeks of diving to do. Some of we which do. will some of which will be archaeological in nature, but most of which will be geological and and biological in nature after after this. So amazing to watch colleagues from very different disciplines uh, find opportunity and reason to come together in, in the ocean, in the deep sea, and, uh, and uh, learn so many new things, but also think about our, our own fields in new ways. And it's Absolutely, uh, yeah. really fascinating. Yeah, I don't know if I, uh, yeah. Well, if I let off on the on the laterals, we're going to swing right into it. Yeah. So that's there's that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe we can take a quick quick glimpse down there. Yeah, if you think it's safe. Mike, is this where we're anticipating potentially getting to see some of the torpedo damage you were mentioning earlier, or are we not there yet? Uh, well, I don't really know. Um, I mean, it, it struck in four spots. I'm not really sure exactly where, but we're going to um, drop down a couple of times and see if we can see any of it. For a little more historical context, it's probably mentioned earlier, but uh, my understanding is that at least with the Yorktown and likely with the sinking of the Akagi as well and the other associated vessels, it took place almost exactly six months after the Battle of Pearl Harbor, which of course really ignited ignited a war in the Pacific, and um, at least from the U.S. perspective. and. Uh, only six months later, uh, a, a key turning point, and, and as we just learned, a lot, significant loss of life, turning uh, these already sacred waters of Papahanaumokuakea into uh, adding an extra layer, an extra layer of kauna, right, Mahina, an extra layer of meaning, of, of context, um, embedded in this library of knowledge that we associate with Kaiuli, with this deep sea, and mm -hmm. uh, such a Got a ways to go to you know, it's still from the USS Yorktown, which we were on a couple of days ago, and, and <laughs> has already yeah, seems down, like moved into the distant like past. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, maybe learning so much, processing so we much. Should probably let it settle out and see where we are without the laterals, and then I can get us we're off of it. Right. If I let it off, no, no, I know, but if we it. if we come up, and then I can figure out how to get us back in a way. We could just take a quick glimpse down there, and then yeah, get, get back out of here. Sure. Yep. Okay. We'll go down a little bit more. Yeah. Just kind of, yeah, go down quick and, and just take it. Zach and Robert and, and Catalina out. working so well together and closely together in the front row along with the bridge to bring us images that are really hard to get on a single ROV system where we have to be mindful of that cable and doing things so carefully but with so much skill. You look up or up? Yeah, I don't know if you could tell anything down there. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like a, like like a, an explosion there. Looks like it's just some hull plating may have broken off at some point. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, we can come back up. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, let's get clear of that. Yeah, Catalina, if our next move can put us like a little further to yeah. the side, then we'll be able to do that yeah. a little bit better and safer. For sure.
probably be better off once we clear these the gun mounts here too. Yeah. They're kind of sticking out a ways. So the laterals off, and we're going to drift back in a little bit. That way, I can get a. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I'll probably be like over the top of this. Yeah. yeah. Maybe f would five meters be enough clearance? Ten meters. Once, like, if we're lined up with the barrier, right, maybe it'd be better to go ten, and then I can lateral the other direction to try and get over there, and then yeah, are ten you off. off. You're you're going to move directly off. Is that what you're saying? Just yeah, ten just directly, move directly off. Directly off. Yeah. Okay. Like ten meters, and I can yeah, lateral right. back yep. in. Sounds good. That's safer. Three of five. Nautilus. Yep. Just want to point out that if this gun tub is 120 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, and as you'll see. Uh, 81 years later, it is still pointing skyward, uh, locked in place from where it was at, at, at the battle rage, shooting at the aircraft Can that we were coming uh, down. Yep. And uh, okay, zoom in. ultimately, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Around there? You want to go down where that kind of door hatches? Again, Silver Spring, we're so uh, so thankful for the storytelling capacity coming coming from Exploration Command Center, just reminding us of that uh, around that gun would have been sailors in position as the battle raged, pointing that to the sky, um, trying to defend against aerial attack. Okay, can you zoom back out? Okay, coming up. Hard to imagine those sailors a little bit now, 5,300 feet below the surface of the ocean, but uh, we appreciate your reminder and, and the humanity that you're bringing to this to this vessel. You know, yeah, Dan, and there's many, I believe there's many dimensions to language, culture, and history, and when we do this work, this exploration, especially in the Kai'uli, these depths of the ocean, um, the information that we uncover, it really unfolds a new way and reframes how we see these stories, how we see these histories, and how we connect them. Absolutely, Mahina. I know I'm still processing Yorktown, USS Yorktown and that experience and, and to add this to it um, and what might be a busy few days ahead is uh, so much to learn and through the eyes of Atalanta and coming into the depths and with this amazing team we have, it's, uh, it's making the head spin a little bit, but mm -hmm. it's, um, it's important. It's been surreal. Um, it's been a surreal expedition. For sure, yeah. So that's one of the um, one of the circular gun tubs on the I think it was 125 millimeter um, that we the, it's the furthest um, aft of the but similar to the other two that we dropped down in between uh, when we first uh, dived. So we're we're almost where we uh, started on this wreck. Uh, a long, long time ago. 